Hey, what's up, everyone? Patio Slave Podcast here. It's Anthony. It is episode 35, November 5th. It's election week, so I hope everyone wrote in Patio Slave at the ballots. I checked, <laughs> yes. and no one did, but maybe in four years. What do you guys think? Yeah. How are you guys doing? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm doing good, man. I'm feeling good. Yeah, no, uh, it's not election day anymore. It's election week, right? It is election yeah, week. Yeah, you're right. Did I say day? <laughs> thanks, no, thanks, Nevada. No, you said week. You're right. <laughs> yeah, election week. Thursday, yeah, uh, November 5th. And we're not the only nerdery that would be on the ballot because Kanye West as well. So 2024, is it going to be Potty of Slave or Kanye West? <laughs> that'd or be that, James that'd be an epic matchup. <laughs> that would be. And uh, yeah, check us out on the socials, guys. I know we uh, throw this out there every week, but at Potty of Slave on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, as Nate says, we are old school with the email, uh, Potty of Slave podcast at gmail.com. Hit us up with the love mail, the hate mail. We love it all. Uh, segment ideas. Uh, who's your favorite band? Who's your favorite political band? Anything like that, we'd love to hear it. So, uh, what's going on tonight, guys? Speaking of political bands, so we've—I think we made mention of it on our socials this pe- this past week. Both "Battle of L.A." from Rage and "Self-Titled" came out within the last week, right? Right around election time. It's almost like that was yep. by design, right? <laughs> it had to have been. Yeah, th- those guys are those guys are awesome. Obviously, we we talk about Rage pretty much weekly here, uh, as we do with Deftones and a few other bands too. But they're a house band, as Nate likes to say, and I would agree. Those two albums are, I mean, all four are great, right? We've 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 uh, extolled their virtues here numerous times, but for those two to come out right around election time makes complete sense to me. It had to be on purpose. It lined up this week with something with our election again. It was very kind of nuts to have hear those songs again around what's going on today like it like they wrote them yesterday yeah absolutely we did a little we did a little uh write up on instagram and uh was kind of taking notes driving around la and i was just like man these songs are timeless and really speak to what's going on today it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on you know it's just like there's a lot of information coming out there's a lot of transparency with the way things are so uh politically rage against the machine is just straight up you know heavy therapy at the end of the day right oh totally and uh it's funny like, granted, we were much younger, but when those came out, especially Battle of L.A., I don't think I, I knew they played at, like, the, the conventions and stuff, but yep. I probably didn't recognize that that was intentional to release it right on Election Day or whatever. Obviously, now you, you look back and you're like, okay, all right, two-year albums came out this time of year? I get it, that type of thing. But, um, yeah, I bet their spins are up on all the DSPs, and I know I personally played them a lot. I, I spun Battle of L.A. a lot this week. Do you guys listen to them? more this week than usual yeah um i would say uh i was going I just especially with seeing the uh the album anniversary for battle of la because i hadn't listened through that one in in some in a little bit of time because I, I mean i always reach for for evil empire and then we talked about renegades a couple couple weeks back so those ones were kind of front of mind for me before before battle of la but then this week those two came back so i'm like oh man i should i should peep those again it's been a while and Man, it just it does fit, and it's it's almost again it's almost like they wrote everything yesterday, uh, lyrically and it's uh, just the sound. It all fits. It still works today, even though some of those are songs are close to thirty years old. Yeah, it's great. I'm actually happy that that was always my similar to what you're saying tone, kind of the third choice after the first two, but because of that, it almost preserved its uh, spin value. You know, I'm able to put it on now, and it still seems fresh in the songs translate obviously and the band is at the peak of their form and uh can't help but notice uh a screenshot from the testify video with the trump 2000 sign it's just like man they were like the simpsons of music right they called everything yes that's great i I didn't even notice that you know what's one thing i was thinking about is if i was five years younger battle of la would be my favorite album of theirs 100 Mm -hmm. percent bar none because i listen to it now and the only thing that the only reason why it's not in that top spot, I think, is is just because I, I don't have that first connection with it. Honestly, I think that's no, it, was, it. It was Evil Empire, right? It, Evil Empire, yeah. The, the imagery is beautiful. The songs are perfect. The lyrics are great. Mm-hmm. A little commercial in a couple songs. You know, you can tell the, the singles. But other than that, I mean, hey, is this turning into a Rage episode? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it almost did, right? I mean, it almost did. Um, but we want to spend a little more time with them, and, and we'll, we'll do that down the road, I think. But, Nate, you said something that made uh, that kind of got me going here. Spin value. That's fucking great. I love that. <laughs> You're yes. right. It's like maybe I spent more time with those other albums. As much as I love this one, I'm glad that I preserved it a little bit. 
it's got more spin value to me today. But man, that might be that could be a segment down the line. We have a dictionary of nerd terms. Yeah. <laughs> could be on a t-shirt, could be on a po- Instagram post. Who the fuck knows, man? That's we're, we're yeah. always coming up with ideas. Does this podcast have spin value? <laughs> yes. Yes. Increasing spin value week to week, week over week. Limited patio slave merchandise will include spin value. <laughs> well, I mean that first run of stickers is almost gone, so that was limited. <laughs> there you go. No, that's yeah. uh we're not going to get too much more into rage. We have we will definitely deep dive everything, I'm sure at some point. But we do have kind of a fun episode that we came up with this week where there were a couple of stories that kind of we thought fed into each other. One was uh, about streaming platforms, one was about big record companies and one was about live music and they all kind of went hand in hand. So we wanted to kind of come at you with a three-pronged approach. We're a three-headed monster. We figured we'd do this uh, and kind of see, you know, the state of the music industry today, uh, you know, November of 2020. And and we had some ideas about what's going on in the news with that today. So that's that's going to be the main bulk of the episode here tonight. Yeah, and it, it's kind of a revisit to an early, or a couple early episodes where we talked about touring and Ticketmaster and things like that. And then along the way, we've sprinkled in talk about some of the digital service providers. So this will be really kind of a a uh, progress report type of thing of how things are going uh, um, amid uh, amid this chaos amongst this chaos of covid so where do we want to start gentlemen i was going to say i think the first one actually highlights that uh that term you like tone spin value spotify <laughs> is <Yeah>. milking it <laughs> you're right you're right it looks like they're doing a kind of a weird futuristic 2020 version of uh I hate to say it, man, right? It's kind of a taboo term, but uh, payola. Ooh, you said it. Oh, man. Yeah. You might have to edit that out. <laughs> that stings. <laughs> this is going to be up on Spotify's platform, too. Oh, shit. Are we going to get yeah. censored? We're gonna I'll get strike. We won't, um, we won't put hashtag Spotify in the write-up. Smart. That's smart. That's smart. <laughs> but it probably will be in the title, so they, they'll, they'll find it. Yeah, if they're paying attention. <laughs> So yeah, basically the the headline in the in the articles and whatnot that we've been reading is basically Spotify now gives you the option of giving your mu- music an algorithmic boost in exchange for a lowered royalty rate. So basically, um, it's only going to apply to Spotify Radio and Spotify playlists. It won't apply to like when you search for an artist and whatnot. But um, yeah, so basically, labels or rights holders will agree to be paid a lowered royalty rate in exchange for a boost. I love that term, a boost. It's like a yeah. cheat code in a game or something. Game, it's a game <laughs> genie. How do, how do they even quantify said boost? That's what I want to know. Like just That's good. good question. Like what the what the hell, man? Like okay, you're going to you're going to put it on this one extra playlist and cut my spin money by 10 cents a stream. Screw you. You're right. The transparency is really not there for the artist or for the label for that matter. So, you're taking their word for it, but it's just another great example of uh Speaking of progress support, uh, Tuan, on old episodes, kind of relating this to a, a retail environment where you're getting the case stack uh, of your favorite beer in front of the store where everyone else is kind of behind. But, you know, that's a different situation because you can see it physically, but that's kind of how this is supposed to play out, right? You're getting some more uh, real estate on the floor. You but stole my analogy. Really... You stole my analogy. Oh, really? Oh, Shit. totally. <laughs> but I'll get into it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it's basically the same thing, right? It's it's big box marketing. It's uh, plays well into 2020. I know there's a lot of controversy with the rich getting richer. This is just another uh, another um, you know say into that and uh, see how that plays out. But you know, if you're a big a big time band, an artist that has the the bank account to to bankroll it, yeah, you can you can edge that out and get lesser spins or sorry, less payouts. The indie, the indie uh, bands and artists are kind of screwed. You know, they don't have that that bankroll to to move to the front of the line. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. This this hurts indie music, uh, not to to mention how bad indie music has been hurt by this year on the whole. Throw this into the mix. Like, OK, Taylor Swift says, yeah, here's a couple extra bucks. Uh, you take that off the top so you can, re- you know, maybe she re-records her uh, albums that she's now able to re-record some of her old stuff. Maybe she's like, yeah, just uh, don't pay me as much for streams on those. They're older, but they're going to get streamed. Put them right up front, and people are you know, going to be looking for Taylor Swift. So I'm going to get – you're not going to get any of that indie stuff. You're not going to find anybody that way. You can't go see them at a venue to find them that way. How are these indie musicians going to survive, man? Like it's just 
this is another one of those situations where the, the, the little guy gets kind of pushed out. The small business gets pushed out for the, the Budweiser, as it were. Yeah, it, it's funny. My first reaction actually was my initial re- gut reaction, initial reaction was actually one that was kind of positive. It was one that I said, hey, you know what? For a small band that's looking to explode, who's not making any money now anyway, hey, why not? Take a, take a gamble, try to get out there. So an, an artist that's self-releasing their music or a sm- even a small indie label. And then I really thought about it, and I think it's a bad it's a bad idea all around. It's a shitty move. And the reason is, is I'll use the Walmart analogy, which I used a few episodes back or whatever. The reason Walmart works is you agree, as a someone who's providing the product, you agree to take smaller margin to get real estate, shelf space. The reason why that model works is there's fixed aisles and fixed shelf space. It's fixed. In this model, equating this Spotify thing, it's endless aisles. At the end of the day, you're still in Walmart, but it's endless aisles. So that advantage you had of the fixed shelf space is gone. But then you'd say, hey, I don't want to go into this Walmart that's now 10 times the size, you're at a disadvantage from those sorry saps who decided to go into this massive Walmart. It's like no one, no one wins except Walmart. Yep. Totally. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the, the underlying thing here is that they're going to not have to pay out as much for the stream. And if you want to either be the big artist to take the gamble to have your stuff featured in this massive Walmart that is never ending, like Bed Bath & Beyond and what's the beyond part, it's this. It's it's okay for them because they're still going to have people finding them. But it, this does not help anybody who hasn't really made a name for themselves yet, or or, or has a small following uh, and can't afford to change what they get for uh, for streams for their music because that's how they make most of their money. Yeah, it's super interesting, and it just made me think. You know, of Instagram, for instance, you see some indie brands on there that are sponsored ads, right? And it might be a brand you've never heard of. And so they're poning up all their trade spend for that one ad, hoping to at least break even, some kind of break even analysis. And then maybe hopefully get the customer on a, a subscription or something to eventually, you know, be in the green. But this is still doesn't really add up to that because like you said, it's a Walmart type environment. So at the end of the day, like it still caters to the you know, like let's let's say like the big four. You know, like they and whoever distributes them, and they're top of mind, and they're the ones that have the 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 boys club or whatever. Like the indie labels fighting against that, even then. So, oh, totally. I don't know. It's just and, it's just like a recurring snake eating its tail type situation. It's too bad. Yeah, and and if if and here's the thing is I don't know if they're gonna make it fixed. Like only a certain amount of people can opt in. If they're not gonna make it fixed, then it's that big oversized Walmart where. Yeah, you're in Walmart, but you're lo- you're again, you're lost in a sea of of artists or in this case, you know, other products of your of your type. The other thing I was thinking about is like who says they're going to stop here? Mm-hmm. You could t- you could take it another level and say, "Hey, we'll give it another boost. You get another <laughs> boost and you'll you'll get a fraction less of a fraction of a penny." And they, again, it's a cat and mouse game where you then then the next guy's like, "Well, geez, my shit's not getting hurt. I'm going to take that gamble." And before you know it, you're not getting paid anything. No one gets paid anything. You accept that your music gets heard and you hope you can make it up in touring, you know? Yeah, yeah. The other thing with that is, okay, so that person or artist puts some, says, you know what, I'm not getting heard and I want to be exposed a little more. I'm going to, I'll take the cut just to see if I can get some more exposure. Maybe they're not heard because they're not good. Like, (laughs) it doesn't, it doesn't factor that. And I don't know who this is. I'm not, pinpointing any one particular band or artist but maybe they're not good and that's the reason they haven't made any hay or maybe they're good for where they are and that's what they're going to be they're just stuck in their in where you know the the region that they're at and they're they're good playing their local bar circuit and that's what they are that's that's the type of musician that they are nothing wrong with that i love some of those but at the same time that maybe they're not supposed to be scaled up and but they're not good enough to be scaled up, and now you're forcing that down my throat as a Spotify user. I don't want to listen to garbage, but put the good stuff on. What about the band garbage? Will you listen to them? <laughs> yes. Yep. We like we I like was that just band. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, to your point, Tone. You know, at the end of the day, like 
the artist may suffer, but the label, no matter what, will cash in, right? Because even if the the band flops, they've they've you know sign they've had that artist sign their uh, soul away for royalties. So um, if they're going through that, you're talking about independent might be a different, but yeah, then yeah. then it's a loss leader no matter what. Yeah, that um, and I, I, I think you might be trying to segue to our next piece, but a little not, bit. not yet. Bit. I have I have one more thing I want to add. I think I got something I would to love, add. Yeah. I would love to see the fine print on on this deal. Like, is it okay? We'll put you in this one playlist, or we'll put you in these playlists for a week, or two weeks, or a month, or whatever, or however long you want to take the loss. We'll leave it up. How does that all work? Like, I, I'd love to see how this fine print shakes out. Yeah, is it opt in? Is it opt out? you locked in for life but no i don't think the labels i mean the labels are getting a worse deal too again with the tangible side of it, the tangible side of it being less of a royalty amount the intangible is more exposure etc but tone you made an interesting point which is maybe these bands suck and that's why they're not getting exposure which means that at the end of the day if they're promoting trash the product the overall spotify product is now less of less quality totally and then i just i'll choose not to listen to the playlist i'll just fire up uh the new deftones album at my discretion you know it's true and then they're not making they're not making any money off of that because they're not getting the streams so spotify's i wonder how that's going to work out for them so if they're saying yes to anybody all taking all comers uh (laughs) they're going to just play this music and if nobody's listening to it they're not getting their half a cut the stream back that i mean they, wow. they had a, they, there has to be some i guess oversight like oh yeah no this song will work for us let's do it or it's starting to blow up on tiktok we should get out in front of this and offer them some more exposure which doesn't make any sense for the artist to do but they're gonna do that to somebody and someone's gonna say yeah do it because it's gonna get us more exposure it's crazy somehow this is gonna end up back to whoever has the deepest pockets is the only one that can even hang with this totally that's where my head went. That's what I was thinking earlier is just like, you know, if you're a big player, big four label or something like that, you know, you can keep funneling money even with the flops, like you've already had them sign their life away. So that fraction of a royalty is mostly still going to the label if you're dumb right. enough to sign to a major at this point. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they'll just rake in for all the losses. They have some big wins and it all kind of plays out. But to your point, Tone, even... um, you just said it right there. It's self-policed. So it's like USDA. It's like, you know, there's no one policing the USDA. It's all internal. So you have to almost trust the process. So Spotify being transparent or are they, you know, taking bribes behind closed doors? It's, yeah. That worries me. The, the yeah. not, bri- not necessarily bribes per se, but that worries me. I don't, yeah. I, I, everything is curated nowadays, right? We don't often in our DSPs or in our television or every, it's like you always get that for you next. And mm-hmm. I, I like to obviously outsource that to friends. I have friends that tell me that have helped me with music. Obviously you guys being a big influence on what I've listened to over the course of my life. Same thing with television, but at the same time, I don't, I don't want a big company telling me what to watch and listen while they just make money off it. Cause that's all they care about. Like, I guess, I'm being naive because that's been happening <laughs> to us our whole lives. It, it's going to continue to happen, but it, it something feels dirty about, I guess it being out in the open now because it is out in the open. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's crazy. It, it, it's, I go back to, it's almost like the Spotify knows that labels are raking right now and want to tap into that. And I know that because that's our second item, which is label revenues are up big, right? Huge in Q3, yeah. 11.2%. It's crazy. Yeah, I think I read that uh, revenues were up in Q3 for Universal, up like 22%, and for Sony, up 19%. And it's got to be year over year. I think that's the metric, year over year. That's what. Yeah, it is it's year yeah. over year, and they're all up, and they're up for a couple of reasons, and so, a little bit of it is fool's gold, right? Like, they're up, but it's because they haven't, maybe signed a bunch of artists because there isn't but much to do there. They haven't put out a bunch of physical product. I mean, we've seen some stuff, um, mostly Evergreen, your, your Linkin Park 20-year um, hybrid theory stuff, uh, your Tom Petty Wildflowers getting a repress finally, you know, 25 years later, whatever, 26 years later. And that that type of stuff, they're just going to the well on that. And I think, Twan, you made that. It's coming to fruition a little early. You made that uh, prediction back 
geez, I don't know, it was probably like 14 episodes ago when we did a little prediction episode. And it, it Which was episode? like, four, uh, I want to say it was 18, but don't, yeah, it was 18. <laughs> uh, I knew it. I knew you knew. Not, not even looking. <laughs> uh, it was 18. Uh, and we, we went through it and had a couple of predictions and Tuan's prediction was 2021 was going to be the year of the repress, but it's kind of happened in 2020. Like you were even on it, you know, as it was happening, you I were think seeing they heard it this, I, They heard us and they said, we got to get yeah. on that. So it's just going to be one of those things that they've made a lot of money on, on evergreen stuff that's been out for a while that they haven't had to spend a lot to, to do that. I think will end up changing as less and less, big artists can go out and tour on a new record where they'd be making more money. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, licensing going on too, you know, licensees. I hear a lot of, uh, you know, artists on shows, everyone's watching TV, Netflix and stuff like that. You hear songs kind of tied into, to shows there and Hulu, obviously anything that's on traditional television as well. So that's all funneling back movies that are being promoted. You know, all that stuff is that was in the works, obviously prior and I can't help but think that, you know, the amount of money they're saving on, you know, expenditure, they're not, it's not like these reps are going out to dinners and doing all the lavish stuff anymore. So I don't know if there's, you know, kind of moving money around too and making those books look even better. There might be some, something to that as well. Yeah, totally. And the other big narrative is the revenues are up because streaming is up during mm-hmm. the, during, you beat me to it. Yeah. During COVID during, yep. I think we talked about this earlier. Ooh, episode two, episode three. It was very early. Was and very if you go early. back and listen to try to fact check me, it will be there a and B be gentle. We were, didn't know what we were doing yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it, it's kind of funny. Like this whole thing is flipped on its head because early on streaming numbers were down a little bit. And then yep. obviously they've course corrected massively. I can personally attest to that. In the early days of COVID, I'm still trying to find out, figure out my life. You know what I mean? Figure out this work from home thing and and all that. But now I'm I'm listening to music maybe two or three hours a day, you know, working from home more than I was in the office for sure. So I can definitely see that. That's the big narrative. So that's obviously where the money is. Mm-hmm. That's a big reason for it. But you're right. I mean, there's, you know, how do you increase your, your 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 profit? You either increase top line revenues, or you decrease expenditures and expenses. They're doing both, obviously. I'm sure they've cut staff. I'm sure they're they're raking from streaming. There's your top yeah. line. Yeah, they're definitely raking from streaming because the streaming numbers blew up in the last six months. You're right. I think early on, um, people working from home, people's jobs changing. All that stuff, um, when people losing jobs, it made it difficult to even think about wanting to toss a record on. But now it's it's become right back into part of everybody's every day and maybe more so than it was before. I think for me, this just doing this, talking to you guys and not having it's we call it nerd homework. It's not really homework because we want to do it. Like I want to yeah. go back and listen to Battle of L.A. I want to go back and listen to an album that um, we brought up from. A 20 year anniversary it's been fun to go back and find those things and those things don't cost the label any money if they're big bands they don't cost the label a ton of money to to put out right like it's just i'm turning it on and they're getting streaming money from it so it's a reason that they've been able to just kind of sit back and make a little more money this year than they typically would have yeah great call and twan also also great call to to really humanize the whole experience on a personal level when I think about how much music I used to listen to as a nerd, and we all, you know, put this podcast together because of our appreci- appreciation for music, but now, man, like, if I'm working a ten-hour workday, like, I'm listening. You said three hours, one, yeah, two or three, probably on average. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think I'm averaging like nine hours a day between music and podcasts. It's just on the whole time. It's mm-hmm. it's borderline unhealthy. Yeah, so uh, learning a lot of cool stuff, checking out a lot of music, but um the amount of uh, revenue that I'm helping pump out and the amount of ads that I'm shuffling through. And, you know, I try to fast forward through that stuff if I can, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've never consumed so much in my whole life. You know, I feel like I have all this free time and it's really just in the background and I'm somehow multitasking. I got to ask Nate, did you mm -hmm. listen to the entirety of that Kanye interview? I did. I listened to every uh, Joe Rogan podcast in its entirety. How? how, Dude. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's what I mean. So it's sometimes it's in the background. So I'll, you know, if something catches my ear that I'm interested, I'll kind of, I'll uh, focus in and then focus yeah, out. Yeah, Kanye was fair. that was a tough, 
It, it was, was a, a three-hour run-on sentence. I made it about 40 minutes and said, I got to be done. I can't do this That's anymore. That's where I cut it off. Yeah, 30 <laughs> yeah. minutes or so. I was like, and I was watching it on the TV, on the YouTube app. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. was like, ah, I think I'm done here. Yeah, no, and yes, I did the same thing. And I think I texted you guys. I was like, how how far did you make it? Because <laughs> I can't <laughs> do it anymore. He, Rogan said three words in the first 40 minutes. And like, yeah, I'm not there to just hear Joe Rogan talk. He does that every four times a week. I wanted to hear what Kanye had to say, but he wasn't saying anything. And it was, he would have been a great president. <laughs> he he could talk for days and give you absolutely nothing. <laughs> Damn, drum roll. That was a good one. Yeah, no, I didn't it was, mean to uh, tangent on you there. I had to. No, it's a good one. It was a tough hang, you know. Um, yeah, the most I got out of it is Kanye's a billionaire, Kanye's a billionaire, Kanye's a billionaire. Yeah, he's right. done. And, and Jesus, a lot of Jesus. And a lot of Jesus, yeah. So those are the two. And he's a visionary with uh, no execution. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he'd be make he'd be great in politics. He really? Would yeah. Be, yeah. He really. I mean, he he may still be. We don't know. This might be another stay in your lane thing. Like you know, music was good. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But for Joe Rogan, I listened to all of them just because uh you know obviously he's the king of podcasts. But I, a lot of uh, I think we've talked about it on here before. I mean, it's such a hybrid. It's such a spectrum of uh of talent on there and people on there so i'm just learning new stuff all the day so i kind of take it totally. as a, yeah. a way to learn skills or just man i didn't know about that about the universe or about ai and what's going to happen in 2025 and how live concerts are going to be in a year from now stuff like that 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 does tie into live music obviously the the reason that the big artists the, the, the big record companies aren't going to continue to make this money is at some point those big artists that they've signed the the taylor swifts and whoever Drake, yeah. uh, they need to put records out and they need to tour on those records. So they, they, uh, they've had a good year and good for them, but at some point that's going to, the, the rubber's going to meet the road. They're going to find the wall and they're going to have to jump over it. And uh, that would lead to live music coming back, I think, for them. They, they would need that for sure. And the artists definitely need that. One thought, and, and I haven't thought this through, but one thought is if this is the new normal, is there any incentive at all for any of the majors to ever sign a new act because where mm. I go with this is in this new model where it's, I don't, again, I'm assuming they're not signing anyone. It's all back catalog. There's got to be someone who can look at a label and say, Hey, we could float this with X amount of staff members and nix everyone out, everyone out. So unless you're the CEO and the uh, C-suite, you know, C-suite uh, personnel, and then just, you know, bare bones employees, you know, a couple hundred, you could really rake because they could uh, like the Madonna's back catalog promotes itself. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. need any promotion. At some point, that's not going to that's not going to be enough, though. You right? don't think for for what? Greedy hands or for greedy? for everything? Um, no, they, they would make I, I'm not talking about monetarily. I think you're right. I think they would rake. And especially if they put a bare bones team together to just promote back catalog stuff and re-release things and you know spruce it up and et cetera, et cetera. But I think at some point people will get sick of the same old, same old. I mean, you're seeing it with our, not to get too COVID related here, but you're seeing it with the country right now. The numbers are rising all over the place because people are sick of the, co- the quarantine. They're sick of the lockdown. They don't want to yeah. do the same thing again. And this is a little bit of a stretch, but it's similar to you don't, I don't, I don't want the same thing over and over again. I like mm-hmm. the new stuff. I, that's why I listen to podcasts. That's why I like to um, check out new shows when they, you know, come out because it's something new. It's not something I've seen 30 times. Not that being said, I've watched The Office however many times. I've watched Seinfeld a million times. Like, it's <laughs> there is something to be said for those evergreen back catalog things. But say, say the Celtics never come back. Being a big NBA fan myself, if they never come back, am I going to be comfortable with watching the 86 season over and over again, or the 2008 season over and over again? I know how it, ha- I know what happens. I know how it ends up. I know every note to that year. Cause I was, I lived it and was in it big time. At some point I'm going to want a new Celtics season. You know what I mean? Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah. You just stuffed that idea in a locker. I think. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't even think it through. I'm just trying to think like there might be oh, some like labels it. that might just say, Hey, you know what? just rake what's the um what's the a syndicate like syndicated television you know what i mean it's that same thing same Absolutely. concept yeah yeah oh totally no to your point uh tuan you know if if they just did go to the bare bones and it was c-suite and some staff that was absolutely necessary 
they could really just partner and depend on people that have built out the infrastructure for the other part of the business. Um, especially when you think of physical content records and stuff. Was it Utone that tried to order a record from, from Warner Bros. And I tried to get diamondize around when yeah, it, they couldn't with, fulfill it. They couldn't yeah, fulfill they, it. They took my money. And then like three weeks later, they're like, yeah, sorry, we don't have that. Yeah. I can already see the warehouse. <laughs> what do you mean like, you don't dumb. have that? <laughs> I can already see the warehouse dusty, unorganized. And it's like, shit, man, let's just switch to partnering with Amazon. They have it all built out. Everything's categorized. Everything's organized digitally. Will be no oversight. We'll have higher sales because we're we have a system that works. This old warehouse that we built in the 1970s, like we don't even know where where what anything is. You know, it's like mismanaged boxes of records that are written in Sharpie. Uh, you think it's a big label, but uh, you know it's just not what they specialize in. So yeah, that could be a, a continuous change on. Hey, let's pivot to an infrastructure that works rather than try to do it all. I think um, your idea, Tuan, I know I, I stuffed it in a locker per se, but your idea isn't bad in a short-term couple-of-year play. Yeah, no, totally, totally. It, 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 uh, it makes sense in that, that realm because you can, if, you, if you can see a light at the end of the tunnel, which right now we may, maybe can't see that, but it, it, it is there. It's going to happen at some point. We are going to get back to that to somewhat normal or more normal than we're at right now. And if you can ride out the storm by cutting costs a little bit, by maybe canning a few people, unfortunately, I don't want that to happen to anybody. And going all in on your back catalog stuff, especially if your back catalog is extensive and popular. Yeah, I could see that working for a year and a half or two. Totally. That's probably the, the realistically, that's probably the time frame this will happen. I mean, how many bands are trying to get signed right now? I, I, I assume that's down too. You know what I mean? Just the, oh, totally. the output of, of music or, or maybe people are holed up trying to come out with something, but... Nate, I think you're on to something with the, if this is a long-term play, they'll just lean on augmenting their staff with specialized companies like the Amazon warehouse, for example, or just mm-hmm. contract out stuff, you know, on an on-demand yeah. basis where they're not, you know, hiring full-time employees with full-time benefits and going down that road and having to find them busy work. You know, they can just augment staff as needed and scale up just like they would with their their hardware yep. especially when they get get busy again that that's definitely going to happen did you you did see in one of those articles that i sent the number of songs that have been added to spotify's library this year no i didn't see 70 that. million oh, or something yeah they they were touting 70 i think it was 70 million songs but wow. like the last time they did it was a year year and a half ago and it was 50 so just think about the exponential growth of their library that is hmm. a lot of people like us being a creator in their space, wherever they live, with a MacBook and a microphone and, a, you know, a, a guitar. <laughs> Two turntables <laughs> like a, and a microphone. Yeah, there's a lot of people doing that. So <laughs> uh, maybe that's the next way those those types of people get signed is that music hits and someone is you just hire somebody at these big labels to listen to. You know, you're going to sift through some garbage, but listen through some stuff. And you'll find somebody that's put out a bunch of music this year on their own through Spotify. Here it is uploaded. Boom. What do you think? And go from there. Mm. Um, that, that'll that be a way for them to sign people without having to see them or, you know, the, the traditional route. You just called it. You just made another prediction. It's, <laughs> Maybe. It's, yeah. Spotify is the new A&R, right? I was going to say the, the A&R showcase is now Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> the, met- the metrics are can- there. You could pay them. You can have them uh, give you less money per stream, and they will promote you. <laughs> it all ties together, doesn't it? It's unbelievable. I mean, the metrics can, don't lie. Well, we were saying the metrics don't lie. They could lie. It's not going to the earlier part of the segment, but um, if the metrics are there, I mean, it's pretty easy to pitch to a label to be like, hey, these are the metrics. These are the monthly listens for this indie artist that came out of nowhere, out of Anchorage, Alaska, that's you know trying to get his band up and going, and he uploaded it to Spotify and he's getting all these people and then yeah. they can route the tour that way. Once live shows come back together, kind of all goes hand in hand. It's crazy. So the, it'll be, it, it begs the question, if this person has never played music live, are they going to end up being really good? Or is that going to be a situation where they, they're out of their element and they don't know how to handle it? Obviously <laughs> at first for sure. But it's something they end up not being good at. Like I, I think of somebody like Little Dicky. I'm just gonna say Little Dicky. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Who yep. who put out who put out a bunch of random like kind of mixtapey type stuff, and then all of a sudden his first show is massive because the internet broke him, like made him big, and he 
ended up playing this massive show, I think in his home state in Philly. And he was like, I've never done this before. And that crowd is fucking huge. How do I handle that? Like, you don't know what you're doing the first time you go out there. We, anytime you start something, it's it's hard when you've never done it before. So crazy. Like, that's what's going to happen to some of these artists. It's funny you mentioned that. I was thinking of that recently where with the different um, like music tools and programs on your computer that can you know basically produce a drum beat or you know any of these you know pro tools fruity loops any 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 of that stuff you can have a one man band yeah you could just track a guitar and then you could have programmed drums and you could have a full metal band would and just be yourself and um i don't know i guess you could just hire uh hired guns to tour with you yeah and some people do that now but it, more of that will happen yeah Technologies, and this is a tangent off of what we've been talking about. Technology will definitely lead to more artists like that, and it, it makes me think like, what if there were artists that if they weren't in the right time, if they had yeah. been around today, what they would have been able to do with all this technology that they weren't around for then, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that would have just fit better. A guy like Elliot Smith comes to mind. He wrote and mm-hmm. played a lot of his own music, tragically died young suicide and he would have been great in today's world where he could have just put all this stuff together by himself and put it out there Um, and he did that anyway but it would have been really cool to hear it in today's technology yeah his monthly spins on on spotify his metrics would be pretty high for sure Mm -hmm. that's interesting all right nate give us that give us that segue that i stepped on earlier (laughs) i think we were there with the technology (laughs) yeah right into uh the smart ticket stuff the what do they call it i forget smart event Smart event, Ticketmaster, trying to keep live music, get live music going again, right? What is the smart event, Nate? Smart event is uh, very much in tune with what we somewhat predicted on early episodes of where the industry is going. You know, with COVID, the pandemic has also is, uh, changed the landscape for live events as it relates to large crowds and how you operate in you know different states, different jurisdictions different levels of safety and uh, social distancing. So obviously it's different over here in California than it is where you guys are in Maine and fluctuates, uh, seems like every day. So for that matter, Ticketmaster has been working behind the scenes, or I guess, is it Live Nation slash Ticketmaster? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. So it's almost like a part, this is almost like a part two to what we had uh, talked about originally early on in our podcast career, but uh, developments on where they are at today and they're, they're rolling out this new, um, system on how they're looking to bring live music back to the audience. So it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's a technology platform that they've developed that gives, it's really made for the venue. So it's it's the venue and the, and the promoter that gives them insight into uh, ideal capacity, uh, the social distancing recommendations, insight on flow of people into the venue and times, but yeah, it's basically a digital platform that allows them to adapt to COVID safety protocol really in real time. So I almost look at it as a dashboard. Like it's a it's a technology dashboard. It's an, Think of it as a dashboard app type of thing that's yep. catered to a specific venue. Yeah, and, and the NFL is already kind of using this, aren't they? Because there are a couple of different teams that have um, fans allowed for games, Kansas City Chiefs being the one that I think was noted in the article we read. They are a hundred percent digital ticket. There, when the person buys their ticket, or a season ticket holder gets their ticket in their in their phone or their device, they get told when they can go in, where they can go in, and how to handle like which way to go to get to their seats. That's it. Yeah. And, and it keeps. I mean, it's it keeps people from. I mean, I'm sure there's some hiccups of this, but it will give you a guideline as to how to stay safely away from people. You know, for an extended period of time. Part of the fun of going to these events is being around people, but I I understand in the world that we're in right now, especially where there isn't a vaccine and we're all just worried about the COVID stuff, having a company come up with something kind of groundbreaking like this to get you back to the event safely is pretty cool. And we don't often sing Ticketmaster Live Nation's praises here, but I like this. This isn't the worst thing ever. Yeah, in in the full circle nature of it is they have this intel insight in this we'll call it a dashboard, and then it brings it full stream by they're adding features to the Ticketmaster app to be able to for the end user to consume this recommended information that spits out of this incredible software, basically. 
it's pretty pretty crazy. I, I got thoughts. What do you what are you thinking, Nate? Well, when we first brought this up, you mentioned something um, that I thought that actually made my wheel spin even more so, which is this is a big deal. I know you come from the tech background, so you know even more so that this isn't something that they whipped together, right? This took a lot of work. This took a mm -hmm. lot of due diligence to execute and to actually have it roll out and adapt with the current climate is pretty extraordinary. Uh, so one thing I got to say about um, Ticketmaster slash, slash Live Nation is as much as we've criticized their uh, business practices in the past, they've always been uh, cutting edge on what they do. So I can't remember the actual date, but was it uh, about seven years ago or whatever they started to launch the e-tickets? So the electronic e -tickets, tickets. Are, e tickets, I think, were, were sooner or recent, more recent than that. 2017, I think, is what I read. Okay. I was going to say, I know, I know it wasn't too long ago. So that obviously changes the whole dynamic on how you buy tickets, how you transfer tickets. And with regards to my thoughts, that's actually where my, my head first went, uh, mainly because Ticketmaster slash Live Nation essentially owns the whole vertical on, on the live production side of the business, uh, for better or for worse. This is obviously cutting edge and, and very much needed for people like us to get back to the, to, to the live music scene. Uh, but I can't help but think that this also continues to monopolize the industry in Ticketmaster slash Live Nation's mm -hmm. favor. When you think about tickets, you know, they're delegating the tickets, they're delegating the demand, they're saying the way you transfer tickets, that kind of cuts down the secondary market, which they also own. So what does that mean for the pricing? Is, is the price fluctu fluctuating based on demand and how they space out these events? It's going to be uh, very interesting to see how this plays out. It's, it's very big brother isn't it yeah <clears throat> it's very there they're um dictating instead of dictating where the show is who the venue who the artist is and what time the show is going on all that stuff now they're saying we can tell you to go in at this time you've got to go in that gate where you're going to pass by this and this and this you can see that you can maybe order something from this table, but you're not going to get it there just yet. You're going to get a ping on your phone, maybe 15 minutes into the show. Hey, remember that T-shirt you saw? You should buy it. Like they're totally, totally going to be pushing stuff on people that way, right? That's just going to happen. It's total big brother. That's very interesting. I, I didn't even think of that. Um, and you know what? It's a way, it's a way to, to, yeah, it's a way to track you too. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. oh yeah. I'm just trying to think like they'll know who, yeah, there's time. There'll be time stamps for everything. Yeah. They'll know who's where and when. <laughs> I'm like, every, my mind is blown every now. Every waking second of your concert experience, they're gonna know. They're gonna know where you are. Now, we, I, one would argue on the other side of that. We have a, a cell phone. Most of us have a cell phone in our pocket that already kind of does that. Oh, absolutely. Right? Like, if you're you're sending a text message from your place of work before all this COVID stuff. It's going to ping that tower near your place of work at 9.43 a.m. And that's going to say that's where you were that day or that, that at that time. And same for when you take a call at 12.43. It's just going to be that way. So one would argue on the other side it's already happening that way. But I'm not sure I want this that badly. As much as I want to go to shows, I think I'd rather wear the suit. <laughs> right? <laughs> Change of heart, huh? I'm with you, Twan. I kind of th this uh, what you said tone kind of uh, completely changed my train of thought too. I was not thinking at that level, and it's very Facebooky, right? It's uh, get on my level, bro. <laughs> yeah, can I? I, I got to I gotta stop you for a second. The, yeah. the reason I'm going this way, and we did a whole episode on it. It was episode four. Uh, nice. <laughs> we did a whole episode on the shadiness of Ticketmaster Live Nation. Would you be surprised if they were shady with this? <laughs> no, not at all. Sorry, as you were, Nate. No, absolutely not. If anything, uh, it's it's targeted. You know, it's targeted ads. It's tracking everything, right? It's it's taking full control of the experience in a lot of ways. So, um, yeah, I could see this going going sideways pretty easily, unfortunately. But um, you know, they own everything, so we can't. It's really not a surprise. It's not far fetched that this is the way it would be. But it is it is pretty pretty eerie that like they're telling you when you can buy the t-shirt at the merch booth rather than it being a free choice or, you know, they're saying this is your opportunity to buy a beer. It's, it reminds me of uh, the controversy in the eighties where they used to do the subliminal messages during the movies. I don't know if you guys know about this, but they used to whisper. Say fight club, say fight club. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, they no. Cut the... 
<laughs> not that scene, but similar. This is actually that scene is relating to. This. Uh, yes, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do know. B- BCC yeah. <laughs> or BBC. <laughs> uh, no, so we're targeted ads on basically like there was a subliminal message within the movies. Let's say Jaws, for instance, where it's like go buy popcorn, like in the background, <laughs> and ridiculous. people will be like, oh, I should go buy popcorn. Yeah. So it reminds me of that. So this is a this has been done before. This is just a different version of that. And well, so, it's happening. It's, a little... it's happening now, anyway, yeah. right? I mean, that's yeah. that happens with all, with all, often a lot of our advertising today. It's it's very designed for us to not even notice we're being sold to, even though we're being sold to at every waking moment. Totally. The thing that I thought about Nate and you kind of this is what you said is a good segue to this, but what you basically said is mm-hmm. this is now another differentiator for Ticketmaster and Live Nation to kind of own the landscape, which is and where I'm going with this is this is obviously very expensive software. So they yeah. know, that tells me, they know this is the new norm for at least a while, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And from everything I read, in order for your venue to fit into this platform, it's like very targeted and, and specific like development and configuration, like tech development and configuration to be able to have the v- virtual venue and know where the entrances are and things like that so they can kind of direct traffic. And it's only going to be their venues. You know what I mean? So... Yeah. They're setting the standard. They're setting the bar where they might be the only ones that can even adhere to the COVID standards. Right. That's true. So now it's a wow. huge barrier to entry, and it's just insane. This is bad for, for indie venues on another level, right? Exactly. It's what, yeah. it's what you're saying. Yeah, that's that's where my head goes with this is the indie venues are already in trouble. Indie artists are already in trouble. This is another one of those nails in that coffin, unfortunately. Um, I think it down the road, it becomes something that it's industry standard and maybe there's indie venues still kicking around that can, that can adhere to this because making an app is cheaper in 2027 than it is in 2004. Um, but yeah, it's, it's right now, if this becomes the way it has to be and it's the regulation and it becomes the law of the land type of deal, it's going to be a problem for any venues. Yeah. Well, actually, Tuan, your point too. I mean, this basically cements that Live Nation slash Ticketmaster will become, if not already, the Amazon of the entertainment industry because their protocols and their this system, this software will have to funnel through even independence. So they'll, they'll get a cut of, you know, literally everything. Um, I'm even thinking of movie theaters at this matter, like AMC theaters, all these movie theaters that are going out of business. Well, they can just soak those up and whether it be like a virtual concert or whatever it is, apply the same protocols and start to just clean, you know, take take ownership of anything that, you know, resembles some some kind of venue. Uh, I can see this going into trade shows that I used to attend and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's really kind of a domino effect. So I'm sure they're, you know, seeing the the money signs with the fact that they're the only ones that have this kind of financial capacity to roll something out like this, uh, unless someone independently rivals this this is a this is a you know checkmate independently i think that would be hard another big business amazon apple could google could pull that off i think i would be just just as concerned with those companies having all of that information but they again they they have it all anyway um facebook it it's it's out there uh people are unless you're living off the grid and don't have a cell phone and don't you know, have a barely even have a landline type of deal. You're you're not you're not concerned with that. But the rest of us are living in the very technologically advanced 2020, and our moves are tracked. It is what it is. Yeah. No, I'm not sure. And now I feel bad about this whole thing. I was kind of excited about it at the beginning, and now I'm like, damn it, <laughs> damn it, Ticketmaster, you did it to me again. Well, because they're they're dropping money on this smart event software, but then they're also investing in the Ticketmaster app and. Both of those aren't cheap. Obviously, I'd love to know the cost of Smart Event because they obviously had to contract that out and massive overhead to to pull that off. But they're adding features to the app, like I said, to bring it full circle, which is the contactless payment and the mobile ordering and all that. In-venue experiences, the delivering your beer, like you said, Nate, at a certain time. And what that tells me, I mean, think about that. Say you're at the Tweeter Center in Massachusetts and you have the ability to order merch from your seat. I call we called this back episode seven or something, six. Totally. Two. Yeah, yeah, that's another one. Insert yep. insert that sound right here. <laughs> we called this. <laughs> totally. Yes. We absolutely did. This is another one. But who 
who has to deliver that merch to you? It's another staff member. So or Amazon drones. Or Amazon drones. <laughs> I don't know if we're quite <laughs> there yet, but it's another staff member. We're, we're getting there. And who, uh, who has to pay for that? Well, it's the venue. And who pays for that? The ticket holder. I think yep. you'll see as a result of this, prices will go up. And they'll have to go up not only to pay for all this bullshit, but the capacity will be less. Right, and it'll be the Just. only thing out there. So it'll be that's why another reason it'll go up. You want to go to this show? You want to go? It's a limited capacity at. It could be a place like Gillette Stadium or Arrowhead Stadium where uh, two football teams play, but they can't fill it to capacity. So you want to be somebody that gets to go to this? It's going to cost you three times what it would have cost if we could fill the place. Yeah. Yes. Actually, both of what you just said is where my head was going which is this caters to large scale venues only based on trying to keep something at a capacity that generates any kind of revenue. But secondly, I think I read somewhere in that article that it kind of rotates the crowd within the venue. So you kind of have an equal opportunity on where you're sitting within the venue. Um, That's weird. And it reminds, yeah. And it reminds me of the tickets that I have on hold right now for um, seven shows and obviously, those were sold at a full capacity, sold out venues, right, all across uh, the West Coast of the United States. And those are going to have to be spread out, I mean, I don't even know, between like seven days now. Mm-hmm. And how is that experience going to play out? Is that something I'm going to want to even participate in? Like the seat that you bought, that front, and I don't have front row seats, but that front row seat no longer is valid. But I think you're absolutely on point, uh, Tuan with the fact that no matter what prices are going to go up, because this is going to be an ex- exclusive thing. It's like you're lucky to get in. That used to be the case with any concert. Now it's like, well, there's only so many seats. So what is that? How does that lead to scalping? Well, I guess oh, these wow. tickets That's where are I was all. Go. <laughs> yeah, all these tickets are safe tickets, right? So there's no uh, secondary market anymore, and we've no, also. No, I, 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 I stop you in the in their blog post. It's it did make mention of not just them having the ticket. It said they could track it even if it left where it was really? so that means okay. going to your stub hubs and going to your ace tickets or whatever places that that are secondary markets yeah no no they wow. were they were quick to say that these could end up on a secondary market without blatantly coming out and saying it and that makes money for them too right i mean ticket exchange the Ticketmaster ticket exchange yeah oh my god Don't pearl jam front and center that. five grand ridiculous <laughs> And they take Again. another cut. We've done this before. <laughs> We've done. Well, it's just interesting because it goes into that self-policing where it's like they own the secondary exactly. market and the regular market and the system that runs the secondary and primary market. Like, it's just like the epitome of an, a, mono- a monopoly, basically. But um, <laughs> I also got to say RIP to paper tickets. Like, it's it's officially done. And that right? sucks, right? Oh, I love man. that shit. We sometimes, yeah. we, full, full disclosure to our pod heads out there, occasionally we'll look for a, uh, a ticket stub to do like an on this day of a, a concert that we went to. And we've done a few of those in the, in the fairly recent past. And um, sometimes I don't have the ticket stub because it was digital and that sucks. I yeah. want the actual ticket stub. So now we, now we're forced to buy a t-shirt or we're forced to buy a print because you need something from that night to bring home with you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, no, totally. And that's actually where my head was going next is 360 deals are going to go through the roof with something like this. Right. It's like you sell my so? t-shirt. Yeah, I just feel like it's just a merchandising opportunity that's uh, unpassable. It's like, hey, yeah, print my name on the Pepsi cup, whatever, you know, whatever I can get more revenue off of as an artist. And obviously funnels back to the label or Spotify, whoever it is. So everyone's just going to be selling out just because it's the only way to get close to what it was like pre-COVID. They're going to have to sell out. I don't know. You, you guys are we've talked about Bill Simmons podcast in the past. Um, he's a sports guy talks about um, a bunch of different sports, mainly NBA. And most recently this week was talking about the NBA and how they were going to come up with their shortfall. And that he was like, maybe they'll go to a different type of advertising. They've, I guess, famously been anti hard liquor. Maybe they're letting Jack Daniels and makers Mark and those types come in to make some of that money back. Same idea, right? Like this is just, Mm -hmm. it's going to get crazy. People are going to, find ways to make their money yeah hey put maynard says put my name on that pepsi cup which would be so anti maynard james keenan exactly 35 seconds ago but now that he's not making the money he was making that he could be making it might change his tune a little bit i mean can you picture this now you're at i'll use the tweeter center or whatever it's called now comcast center in massachusetts you're, you're in your seat 
there's people six feet to your all directions, a uh, notification comes up on your phone. Hey, dude, you can order beer in the next five minutes because another round of, you know, the delivery guy or girl is coming around. So you, you do that. You get a Heineken. So then another half hour goes At $15. by. $15. At $15. <laughs> another half hour goes by. And you get another pop-up. Hey, you're eligible for another beer order. And you pass on that one. So you pass on it. And then another half hour goes, hey, dude, you're ready for another beer. You can get $2 off this one because we know you skipped oh, the last shit. one. Oh, it's, it's, shit. Oh, I'm telling man. you, it's going to be a, it's gonna be like a di- digital pop It's going to be like real-life pop-ups. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Unbelievable. That's so I hadn't even thought of that. And you're right. That's exactly what's gonna happen. Demo every move. Um all I can see, wow. and this is a this is a little far fetched, but it's late <laughs> in the evening and I've had a beer. So all I can see is people sitting in their seats or up in the lawn at, at this venue in Massachusetts that we've all been to, and these drones just dropping <laughs> aluminum cans on people's heads. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your beer. Oh shit, that wasn't meant for me. That was meant to the guy, for the guy, eight feet to my left or fifteen feet to my left. And now you're fighting for it. And now more COVID is being spread. This is bad news. Just shut the whole thing down. <laughs> An end of the night fire sale where they're doing five dollar tall boys, and they're still making massive margins on it. And uh-huh. they're yep. just tall boys flying around. Wow. They're half full. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the three angles of insight because it just gets my wheel spinning so much. It's like. Yeah, they're going to time how much beer you can have when you can have it to make sure that you're always a little buzzed but not drunk so you're still capable of being coherent. And then they're going to order the Uber for you, and then they get a royalty off of that because everything is a finder's fee, right? And it just funnels and funnels and funnels from the you getting to the venue, being at the venue, and then going back. It's just all like you're just being sold the whole time. Crazy. Your, your Uber driver is here, and he was, he was COVID tested, so you're good. <laughs> you can't leave your seat unless it's the bathroom. I mean that's that's what it's yeah. gonna be. Yeah. So they can't do a sobriety test or whatever. So they're gonna have to limit it based on time. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, sir. You're out now eligible for a 16 ounce. Or if you wait 10 minutes, you can get a 20 ounce. You know what I mean? It's... Or you have someone in your party designated as the driver, or you you have already ordered your Uber and it's gonna show up at 10:17 when the show is over. 10:25 when the show is over. Or you buy you the VIP package. Or you buy the VI- <laughs> VIP. VIP, you- uh, fresh with eight and OUI. No, the VIP package is a self-driving Tesla system, right? Oh, yes. yes. Love, love. <laughs> or we all just have Teslas and it's fine. Yeah. This was, all, this was all planned 10 years ago. So Elon's behind this whole episode is what you're telling me. <laughs> Damn. How did he do it again? <laughs> I'm just th- I'm just thinking of all the predictions we make. As long as we're always thinking, you know, ten months ahead, it's essentially going to roll out, right? So th- yeah. that's what Ticketmaster is doing. They're essentially planning for where the puck's going, not where it is. Smart though, that's smart. Yeah, I, I get I get maybe I don't know maybe a closing thought. I don't know if you guys have other thoughts, but I have visions. And Nate, you hinted at they'd almost have like a rotation, right? So something. Yeah. All I can imagine is like a airport people mover. That just weaves oh, wow. in and out through the venue, and you're just like Holy turning shit. your head to, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, what, what is this? <laughs> uh, that would be that's that might be kind of fun though. <laughs> that's a that's a really cool visual, actually. I just thought of that just now, and that's the best way to sell merchandise, right? Just literally have people funneling through the whole venue, getting teased, making and giving them that five minute countdown, like an Amazon. You know, or buying tickets where you have so much time to buy the ticket. Oh, there's only 20 T-shirts left when there's really 500 T-shirts left. Oh yeah, that's coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, we just oh. made 10 more T-shirts available. <laughs> oh yeah, the day of. Wait a second, those are always there. You guys suck. Uh, the uh, my only issue with that one, and I'm gonna stuff it. In the, I'm stuffing your idea in a locker one more time tonight. Um, if you're moving, how do they deliver your beer? Right. <laughs> <laughs> The drones, dude. The drones. The drones, yeah. They just fly along with you, and then you like scan your phone, and it hands you the beer. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, it could even be coming directly from the source, right? It's delivered from the brewery, so it's fresh, and that's the value add. If they're close by, I like that. If they're, I mean, oh, you know what though? If I'm at Twitter or Comcast or whatever it is in Massachusetts, you're not that far from Treehouse, and if they're gonna, they want to drone me a beer, I'd be in. <laughs> yeah, 
right? It's Postmates. Postmates, you want your good beer? Do you want the good beer or do you want the venue beer? The venue beer is, you know, 25 bucks. Do you want a pint of Treehouse? It's going to be 45 bucks. But hey, support local. Yeah, and it's coming right to your hand at the show you're at. Yeah, via Amazon drone, yeah. Unbelievable. Bezos. <laughs> yeah, Bezos has a, a good play with this because, he, like we were talking about earlier, he has the infrastructure to support this model. Yes. And I'm sure Ticketmaster is looking at them as a, a viable partner to execute on something like this on all facets, you know, from the bathroom toiletries to, you know, merchandise, f- fulfillment to uh, to vending. So, I mean... It just sad. it's sad because I was mentioning the you know the ticket thing. This is another closing statement for me. I guess it's we've lived a great life in uh, the fandom of music. You know, paper tickets. That's a very tangible memorabilia piece. The posters that were given away from my bins of nerdery, <laughs> mm-hmm. stuff like that. These are all things of the past, right? And you're just not going to see much of that anymore. And then now it's the venues. Uh, I can't help but think that this is only conducive to large scale venues like small theaters this this will not work it'll it just, be hard there's one entrance right most theaters is yeah. one right. entrance yeah. yeah yeah it'll be very hard uh, it, that would be where the timing comes in but and there'll be less people in those venues because of the distancing but that'll be hard and i think at some point in the future we'll be able to go back to some sort of normalcy i'm not sure it'll ever be exactly the way it was before covid but we will have you will see an nfl game with not 2500 people at it you will see a large concert with not 1,500, 2,000 people at it. I just don't know when, and it might be a little while before we see that. And this was an idea to, to try to get people back to that, that uh, those events. And I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't hate it. We right. did kind of poke some holes in it, but I don't hate it. Yeah. No, I think we're, we're, we're closer for sure. I mean, you got to make the, you got to really think about it. Would you rather have nothing or have this? And I think I'd rather yeah. at least have the option for this. I think that's what it comes down to. Definitely. For me. Well, that was fun. Yeah, that was our, our three-pronged look at the, where the music industry is at right now. And, uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, where it is now, where it's going. A lot of predictions that we made that uh, happened to roll out. I think we were talking about something earlier where it's like, man, don't give out too many ideas. I think they are listening. They're listening. <laughs> they're ex- yeah, we yeah. should we should start charging. <laughs> yeah, we know what's up. Hey, okay, so episode 35, right? Copyrighted. I'm copywriting it right now. I'm putting it out into the ether. Any of these these ideas that we just came up with, if a Ticketmaster, Live Nation's using them, Spotify is using them, uh, we we hold claim, um, just like Donald Trump holds claim to those electoral college votes that he said he got yesterday. Uh, we're in. We're there, It's ours, and you're going to pay us for it. Yeah, it's IP. We got it. We came up with it. Episode 35, <laughs> mic drop. Boom. <laughs> Peace, potheads. <laughs> See you next week, everyone. Peace. Uh, it's been real. Cheers, everyone. Peace.